Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. That said, if you're in the North Georgia area and you don't have a church you call home, we'd love to have you come and visit Brainerd, North Georgia. I'm praying that this message serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, encourages you, and even challenges you, all the while bringing you closer to Jesus. So again, super excited that you're checking out this video. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for church, and I think that the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. John here helps us to be able to answer a question for all of us. Can we be prepared with our hearts and our souls? John here, through God's use, fulfills his promise to prepare the way for Jesus, the Lamb of God. John helps us answer one of the most important questions for all of us to be prepared to answer. Why on earth did Jesus come to this earth? Why? And John here is able to say, let me give you the answer right from the very text of Scripture. Don't believe me? Let me show you, beginning in verse 19 of John chapter 1. Notice the words of John. It says, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. John is paving the path, preparing the way for everyone there in attendance to know exactly who Jesus is. And that's, that's where we're going to center our entire time around is being able to say, Listen, God uses John to fulfill his promise to prepare the way for Jesus, the very Lamb of God. Let me pray for us. Father, we're grateful for you. We're deeply thankful for the opportunity to be able to center ourselves around your word. We're thankful, God, that we can rest upon the authority of Scripture. We're thankful that we can rest upon what your word says. We don't have to try to figure out who Jesus is. We don't have to try to figure out um, what we need in terms of provision for life's most important question, which is wh- how do we deal with the sin that's inside of us, with the sin of this world, we can rest in the very reality and in the truth that you've spoken. You've made that clear. You've announced to people then as you continue to announce today through the means of your word that Jesus is the answer for our brokenness, and our sin. And so, God, I I do pray that through the very means of your word and the work of your Holy Spirit, that you would help, that you would encourage, that you would challenge, that you would even convict this morning. Help me, God, as I declare your word. And I pray that you would help us all to be able to see the glory of your son, Jesus, this morning. We love you. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All righty. For one, I want to give us the the roadmap so we can see how God uses John here. And the roadmap is going to come 
uh, by way of days, okay? So beginning here in verse 19 all the way up to chapter 2, presumably it's seven days of what are the start of Jesus' ministry, all right? So it's kind of cool. We're going to spend a week here, the next several weeks, with Jesus and how he walked through this uh, first week of his earthly ministry, all right? But for today, here's the roadmap. Day one, we're going to see the character of John, and day two, we're going to see the declarations of John. But before we arrive to that last day, we've got to start with day one, right? So let's take a look at the very character of John. He opens up here, the author of the gospel, John, right, helping us look at who God uses, the very person, the Baptist, and how God uses the Baptist. And we'll We'll see all of this, I believe, through his very character. So, first of all, John answers boldly and honestly. I mean, we just finished reading it, but we have a few people who decided to come and inquire about who John is. John lately has been declaring a a gospel of repentance in order for people to come and be baptized. He was preparing the way for Jesus, as we're going to notice. And so this really began to spread. It's so much so that the leaders of Jerusalem, the very Sanhedrin, wanted to inquire about who this guy is, what's going on, and, and why things were happening the way that they are. I mean, they took deep interest as to what was going on here, all right? And so He begins this section with this inquiry. They're they're just asking a bunch of questions. Who are you? Who do you say that you are? Are you this person? Are you that person? And John answers boldly and honestly. In fact, that's what verse 20 says. He says, he confessed and did not deny. That's just an eloquent way of saying, I'm going to say what I know is true, and I'm not going to bend the truth. I'm going to give it to you honestly. In fact, he says that. In verse 20, twice the Baptist says, I'm not who you're claiming me to be. And if they didn't get the two other times, three really, of what he's saying, he told them flat out, no, I'm not this person. What's happening here? God, I believe here, is using John to declare the truth that that God would fulfill his promises to his people, specifically his honesty, his boldness, points towards Jesus and not away from him. John understood essentially his role. He knew he wasn't the word. He was just there to point to the word, right? In addition, he displayed boldness because those who approached John the Baptist to inquire about his identity were not representatives from the local Baptist association, right? They're not coming from the Southern Baptist Convention. That's not how it was working here, right? Going around, doing a routine check, to ensure that they had accurate records of the annual baptisms from John the Baptist. No, that's not how that worked. These folks would be the enemies of John and Jesus. They they were not coming because they were excited about what was happening. On the contrary, you often see with the religious elite in Jerusalem that whenever there was some sort of a power shift or attention was given to someone else other than themselves, they did not like it. And they would do anything that they can to snuff all of that out. Why? Because they really liked their power, prestige, prominence, and pomp and circumstance. They loved it all. John was a threat to that. And so what do they do? They send people to find out who this guy is, and John answers boldly and honestly. Secondly, John answers humbly. This is really neat, but notice once again in verse 23. They press him again. Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And then look at verse uh, 24. Excuse me, um, 23. I read 22. My bad. He said, I am a voice, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So again, they're pressing him, right? They have questions for him, right? And John John humbly says, after being asked, well, who in the world are you then? He says, I'm just a voice. In fact, 
I'm the voice crying out from the wilderness, make straight the path. John saw himself as someone who was used by God to point to his purposes and his plans. He didn't make it about himself. He knew that God was weaving together all of redemptive history into that very moment, and so he understood he has a role to play in all of this, and he didn't make it about himself. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 even tells us that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, and it is him you shall listen to. John understood his role, but yet he just says, I'm a voice. John is that prophet that all the way back in the days of Exodus, Moses was speaking about. Jesus would go on to say about John in the 11th chapter of this gospel, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. This guy is being talked about in the Old Testament makes allusions of it in Isaiah. Jesus makes commentary of this dude later in chapter 11, and John says, I'm just a voice. This wasn't John's opportunity to shine. He wasn't some sort of opportunistic evangelist at this moment. No, he lived and maintained a focus, and that focus was God called me to do something, and that was to point to the word that was made flesh. That was it. I, 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 you see his humility, but then beyond that, you could tell that, that John, John had his, his heart and his mind centered really well. How do we know that? Because thirdly, John acknowledges his humanity. Now, now notice what he says beginning in verse 26. John answers them, I baptize you with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Who God uses shines once again through this text. John says that the one who is coming, the one whom I'm pointing to is also the one that I am not even worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. Un worthy. That's how he views himself, as a broken sinner. One commentator said that on the one hand, he stresses the great authority of Jesus, and then on the other hand, he himself claims that he is unworthy to do the most menial service for Jesus. John expresses his humility, and this is not a show. He's not acting here. He understands his place before the king of the universe. This same humility is not something strange in the Bible. In fact, if you trace it from the Old Testament to the New Testament, right, like Isaiah, standing before the throne of God, hearing all the angels cry out before him, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Even Isaiah himself says, I am a man of unclean lips. You fast forward to the New Testament And Paul, greatly used by God all across the Eastern world, a missionary, a brilliant individual, penned like half the New Testament, says he's the chief of all sinners. Peter even saw himself as a broken man and said, get away from me, I am sinful to Jesus. Like, Like John like many others, understood and had his theology correct about himself. What, a, what an individual to be able to take inventory to say, I can't even, I can't even come to the feet of Jesus because I'm unworthy of him. I'm unworthy. You know, across our lifetime, God has purposed to use, to use any one of us along with others in the Bible to fulfill what he desires to accomplish. And John... I believe here, first of all, is an example of his use. He's an instrument in his hand for his honor and for his glory. And guys like you and I are, are, are no different. Sure, yeah, John had a really unique task. He was a voice 
that after four to 500 years of silence, God now is speaking again through his people. But y'all, we are simply a voice, a church declaring the good news of the gospel. Just as John was an instrument of God's use, you and I are a instrument of his use for his honor and for his glory. What, ad- what matters equally as much to God is not just being used by him, but our character. Like, God loves to use broken and weak people for his honor and for his glory. He also loves to use the humble of heart for his purposes. John's life provides a great deal of clarity on both ends. We can be used by God, and character matters. Humility matters, right? John's life also provides clarity for today's voices behind every pulpit. I mean, think of this for a moment. Every pastor needs to be reminded, myself included, that we're not the one. We're just the voice behind the pulpit declaring about the one, right? And Jesus is the one who should be getting all of the attention and all of the recognition, not any one of us from behind the pulpit. Unfortunately, there are, there are far too many celebrity pastors and not enough Christ-centered pastors behind the pulpit. We need more voices like John's that says, I'm just a voice and nothing more. Now, y'all, that's just day one. There's day two. Not only do we see a lot of the character of John just in these few verses, but secondly, we hear the declarations of John on this next day, the second day. Notice what it says in verse 29. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then a remarkable statement here to conclude the day. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. Remarkable from, from John, <clears throat> from John, excuse me. A couple things here that we need to look at. Day one, we learned who and how God uses John. On the second day, we learn what John says to prepare the way for Jesus. So first of all, John declared Jesus to be the Lamb of God. The Baptist declares a title that befits Jesus so well. Before the crowds, John says, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The people who were there, many of which would have been Jewish, should have heard the book of Exodus just ringing through their ears. The Lamb that would have come to mind was the Passover lamb in Exodus. I love what one commentator said. He said, the title lamb combines in one descriptive term the concepts of, listen to me, innocence, voluntary sacrifice, substitutionary atonement, effective obedience, and redemptive power like that of the Passover lamb. That's who Jesus is. A willing, loving, voluntary, substitutionary sacrifice for not just a few sins, but for the sins of the world. Now, for one, like that's incredible to even think about. It answers so many questions for all of us. One primarily is the fact that we need Jesus. He he didn't just come to somehow or another pretend to be a lamb. No, he he was the sacrificial lamb, shouting to all of us that, that his arrival demanded him to be that way because we're broken and sinful people. Like it answers that fundamental question for all of us. We need Jesus 
to be a sacrifice for us because we cannot fix ourselves. Massive statement from, from John. Furthermore, it even fulfills what Isaiah stated. Like this was, this was not just some knee-jerk reaction from God. Long ago, Isaiah said he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. Right, like even Isaiah was like the lamb, the lamb that's coming, the sheep, like that's Jesus. Exodus, the Passover, like it's all giving pictures and pointing forward to who Jesus would be like. And just like God prepared his people in Exodus, John is preparing the people in his day for God's provision. This time, y'all, God's provision, God's provision wasn't an animal. It took on bone and flesh. He became a human in order to save all of us. That is radically different than what was in Exodus and and even more significant in, in the New Testament to see what God would do in order to provide. Then he provided for his people in Egypt. Now he's providing for the world. Incredible. Secondly, not only does he declare that about Jesus, but he declares Jesus to be eternal. He says in verse 30, who ranks before me because he was before me. Now, this is neat. We've often covered the eternality of Jesus. I mean, all of chapter 1, like if you, if you didn't see it, like John was trying to be as explicit as he can when it came to understand that Jesus was God from all of eternity. In fact, the very first verse of John John's gospel is, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? Like, he starts that way. Once again, though, it's covered here. John the Baptist is a cousin of Jesus and was physically born before him, yet the Baptist isn't confused with his theology. He knew all too well that though he might be the older cousin, Jesus is the everlasting one, right? The words spoken by John further help the people understand that God's everlasting plans through his eternal son are being fulfilled in Jesus. Like it's all coming to bear right there in front of them. Thirdly, John testified about the Holy Spirit. Oh man, this, these verses, y'all are chock full. We're not gonna be able to get into everything So this will be like fast-paced, quick hitters, and and one day we'll cover more of it. But let's reorient ourselves really quickly, right? Verse 32, John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Quick thing, the Holy Spirit is not a bird, all right? Just because it says that, he's not a bird, okay? He's the third person of the Trinity, all right? There's, There's a comparison here, like, right? Descended like a dove, it came down and remained on Jesus, right? For, furthermore, it says in verse 33, I myself did not know him. In short, it's not that John didn't know his cousin or they didn't talk about his cousin. That would have been talked about. John, up until this point, did not have the clarity that he needed in order to find out, okay, the, he is the Messiah, And so in this moment, all of these things are being fulfilled, and John is putting all of this together like, that is the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Like, it's all coming to a head for him. So he says, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, thus he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So what's neat, very quickly, John realizes what's happening. Jesus is indwelled by the Holy Spirit and then gives a picture of what happened to him. One day will happen to all of those who would believe in him in the book of Acts. It's a foretaste, which is super cool of what's happening here. But it's beautiful what John is declaring here, right? Beyond that, what he's showing to the crowds is yet another fulfillment of Scripture. Again, this is not a knee-jerk reaction from God. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, he says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Who? Jesus. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. What John testified, again, is just another validation.
recognition of God's faithfulness and a further clarification of Jesus' identity. That's what John's doing there. Beyond that, John is indirectly shouting to the crowd, are you hearing what I am saying? And through it, are you prepared? Are you ready? Like many of you came here by the Jordan thinking that this was, the, this was gonna be one thing, but then all of a sudden, something else is taking place and are you now prepared for what's taking place? It's here now. Like prophets long ago have spoken and now, now we are witnessing all of this being fulfilled before our very eyes. It's here now. He's here now. He's ready to begin his ministry to fulfill everything that God is doing. Now, if they didn't catch that, and if, if that didn't catch their attention, then lastly, John declared Jesus to be the Son of God, the Davidic King, the Messiah, the one who is supposed to come. That's what verse 34 means. <laughs> Y'all, like this was the most shocking of all statements if the other ones, if the other ones weren't already. Now, you can imagine for a moment, right? You got one of those Levites or one of those priests just walking around like, what is this guy saying, right? And he just goes up to someone and he says, hey, what did, what, what did he just say? Like, who's here? Someone giving the guy the cliff notes says, well, my understanding is he's the sin bearer of the world, the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, and the son of God. Like, He's, that's the cliff notes of it, right? But the guy goes on to say, Whoa, I, 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 hold on here. Where's the part of Jesus, this guy, the Messiah, who you claim is, like, where, where's the part where he's kicking down the doors of Rome and overcoming our oppressors? Like, where's that part? You know, he didn't say that. What do you mean he didn't say that? All I know is that John said that he said that he's coming to take away the sins of the world and baptize with the Holy Spirit. That's what I heard. So the guy, a bit puzzled, says, well, I'm just going to ask somebody else. Before he can open his mouth, the other person says, nope, I heard your conversation. I heard the same thing, dude. Sorry. Same, same thing. Another guy comes around. He goes, I don't even bother. I heard what he said. That's exactly what I heard. Even the little boy says, hey, Mr. Priest, John said that he's going to be the lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. That's what he's saying. Now, Think of this for a moment. Like, imagine the conversations that are taking place there. Though some people didn't think of it. In fact, many of them thought they were, they were just preparing for something else altogether, only to find out that John was there to simply prepare them for the Lamb of God. And listen, for many of us, if you remember, like, that's exactly what happened the first time that we heard the gospel, wasn't it? Right? Not for a moment, perhaps, that we thought that we were broken in need of a Savior, wondering to ourselves, well, hold on, I've got a, a lot of questions, only to find out that time after time after time after time, it's, it's the same answer, and the answer is Jesus, every single time. Let me tell you something, a million years from now, the same answer will be true. It's Jesus for our brokenness and for our sin, right? Now, listen to me. John... The Baptist is still that voice today. The difference is, is that the work has been done, the sacrifice was made, and death was conquered. Like that's the difference today as it was then, right? Beyond that, John answered one of the most important questions for all of us. One of them is who Jesus is, and the other is why did he come? And he makes it explicit. His answer is to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of of the world. Now, mind you, what I just said, what John said, is incredibly countercultural. Today, our modern society will shout another gospel altogether that says we don't need a lamb for our sins. Sins? What on earth is that all about? In fact, that's just a, a historic word just made up to hold you back from who you are supposed to be. You believe what you want to believe. You do what you need to do. You just, you just believe your own truth. Embracing that kind of mindset still leaves a lot of really important questions to be answered. Like, what do we do about guilt? Do we put that away? Do we pretend that's not, not a thing? Like, I don't deal with that. 
do we, do we quiet ourselves of the shame that we have perhaps that we can't seem to shake off and, and it becomes like really hard to sleep at night? Like no noise up there. There's nothing in my head rattling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend like nothing's there. There's, I'm just, no, that, I'm fine. Forget pain, forget hurt in our hearts, forget evil, forget suffering, forget everything that we realize as we walk out of these doors and see that, man, there's something deeply wrong with this world, and it needs to be fixed. And if we're brutally honest with ourselves, there's something deeply wrong with us, and we need to be fixed, right? So, it, like, to dismiss the lamb to dismiss him of everything that he is supposed to be is to dismiss reality altogether. We live in a broken world, and the only solution for this broken world is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. He's the only solution. Now, you may be wondering, well, how, Paul, how do I prepare? Your preparation comes through making a path in your heart straight. What does that look like? You humbly hear what John has to say. You lower the guard down, right? Like just put the walls down and be honest. Honest about what? That you are broken beyond your own repair. You cannot fix you. Like I don't care how many podcasts are out there with the next self-help guru. Like they, they are not Jesus. They can't be. And the very fact that you've perhaps arrived there in your heart and mind means you are ready to receive Jesus as your savior. Like if you're humbly admitting I've got a problem and I need fixing, you're right. God's right about what he's called out in my life. That's repentance. Faith is that next step of believing in whom God has provided for you. My question for you, friend, is will you believe in Jesus? Will you trust him? Because he's there. He's provided everything you need in order for you to be saved. And then believer, quickly, like, we are that voice today, are we not? Like, I look across this room and I see voices all over the place. Voices that are ready to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And mind you, they will come with questions. They will come with raised eyebrows. They will come with uncomfortable moments. And John would tell you, I hear you. They came to inquire about me, not because they wanted to be friendly, but because they wanted to get rid of me, right? Like declaring the gospel comes with a cost. I get that. It comes today with the cost of being uncomfortable. But what an encouragement that at home, as mom and dad, you can be a voice. That at work, you can be a voice. That as you frequent all the different places all around Catoosa County and Chattanooga, you can be a voice. To a friend, to a family member, be a voice. And for those of us that need some encouragement, like, think of this for just a moment and be encouraged. God used a man wearing camel's hair for clothing, ate honey and locusts for breakfast, and looked like his hair got shot out of a cannon. If he can use him, surely he can use you. Like, you're not going to Walmart and be like, hey, where's the locusts and honey for breakfast? Like, I, I, where's the aisle for that? Like, that's not happening, Right? Like, you, you can do this, and all that you need to do is be a voice. What voice? Just point to them. Point, point to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. Point to how that Lamb changed your life and how he can change the lives of others. Why do I, I say that and encourage us with all of that? Because y'all, John did the same thing. And God used John to fulfill his promise to prepare the way for Jesus, who is the Lamb of God. And that's our role as well. Let's pray together. Father, I'm thankful for you and thankful for the opportunities that we get a chance to be able to look to your word. And God, I pray this morning that as we as we take a look at our own lives and how we at times perhaps are fearful or perhaps discouraged that, that, that you would even use someone like us, God, I pray that the life of John becomes a point of clarity for all of us. Help us to just be a voice, 
to those around us and to remember that God uses the humble, the weak, the most unlikely of people for his honor, for, for your honor and for your glory. And then God, if there's someone here under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you as Savior, God, I pray that John's voice continues to ring loudly in their hearts. We need your son, Jesus. We're deeply broken. We need your grace. We need your forgiveness. And we are, we are incredibly grateful for your sacrifice. You stepped in when, when we didn't need to be stepped in for, but yet you lovingly and graciously chose to do so. And for that, we are grateful, God, for your grace. And so I pray, Father, for someone who doesn't know you, that they, they would see grace written all over your son Jesus, love written all over your son Jesus. And that the walls would come down, the guards would come down, and humility and brokenness would, would reign so that it would pave the path for accepting your son for all that he is. God, work, please. Help those who need you and help them see the beauty of your son. And for all of us, give us courage day by day to be a voice for you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said,